Welcome to another episode of Logic Made Lucid, an introduction to logic with Dr. Jacob Waldenmeyer. Today we're going to talk about translating sentences into a symbolic form that is convenient for predicate logic and propositional logic. This video already assumes a little bit of understanding of uh, operators and of propositional logic. So you'll be able to follow along much more easily if you are already familiar with those subjects. However, even if you're not, you should be able to follow along fine. So to clarify what we mean by predicate logic, it's important to remember that statements that have declarative or propositional meaning typically relate subjects to predicates, right? So one of the things that's important to remember is that predicates add information to subjects. When you think about some kind of declarative statement, some sort of proposition, then you can usually identify a predicate and a subject. Right? The subject is what the sentence is about, and the predicate is the information that's added to that subject. So for example, we take the sentence, the sun is a mass of incandescent gas. Right? The sun is the subject, and is a mass of incandescent gas is the predicate. That's the information is, that is being added to the subject, which is the sun. If you take an, uh, a sentence like, most atoms pr comprise protons, neutrons, and electrons. Well, in that case, the subject is most atoms. The predicate is comprise protons, neutrons, and electrons. Right? Take another one. If you have a date in Constantinople, she'll be waiting in Istanbul. The subject here, this is a compound sentence, or if we want to understand it that way, and the, the subjects are, if you have a date in Constantinople, she will be waiting in Istanbul. Right? Those are the, the subjects of the sentence of this if-then conditional uh, statement. And the predicates are, have a date in Constantinople, and then she'll be waiting in Istanbul. Now, that might not necessarily square with the way we define things grammatically. However, for predicate logic, notice the focus is kind of on the if-then relationship. And that's going to be important later on, because remember, we, by translating, we want to put sentences into a format where we can properly uh, use natural deduction or analyze them for their logical consistency later on. Now, we won't be doing that in this video. This video is all about translations. So another, another sentence, every adult citizen who is not a felon should be allowed to vote, right? Now, of course, these sentences, uh, this one may be a little bit controversial. Who knows? Either way, it's a proposition, and we can identify its subjects, or every adult citizen who is not a felon, and then the predicate should be allowed to vote. Right? Same case in all of these sentences. All of these sentences are propositions, and so they all can be um, clarified in terms of their subject and predicates. So you'll remember in propositional logic, what we were doing is we were using letters to represent entire phrases that were separated by operators that indicate their logical relationships to those other phrases. So for example, if we take the sun as a mass of incandescent gas, in propositional logic, we could have just simply re represented that by the letter S, because this statement doesn't really include any logical operators. It's just simply a statement. Then there's this one. If you have a date in Constantinople, then she'll be waiting in Istanbul. Clearly, there's a conditional operator, usually what we're using in the notation that would use the horseshoe there as, a, as clarifying the relationship between you having a date in Constantinople and the fact that she's waiting in Istanbul. And you'll remember this from proposition logic. Or every adult citizen who is not a felon should be allowed to vote. We could represent adult citizen with C, uh, not a felon with uh, uh, not F, and then should be allowed to vote with V. All of those, um, all, that entire phrase could be encapsulated in that one letter in propositional logic. But with predicate logic, if we want to be more precise so that specific elements of a statement can be related to those of another, we need a more detailed notation, right? So when we take the sun as a mass of incandescent gas, what we want to do is we want to break that up into its constituents and express it in a way that encapsulates all of the different components of that sentence. So we've got, let's take, for example, the part of the sentence which says the sun is a mass. Let's just isolate that for a moment. The sun is the subject and is a mass is the predicate. Here's what we do with predicate logic. Predicates will be signified by capital letters, right? So is a mass will have some capital letter associated with it. And then their subjects um, are, are, are described with or expressed with lowercase letters. So if S is the sun, and notice we're using a lowercase letter to refer to the sun. And this is going to be important later because we need to keep track of what's the subject and what's the predicate. And then M means is a mass. And notice M is a capital letter. And so what we have is 
MS, capital M, lowercase s. The sun is a mass, right? So um, this is the this is the 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 basic gist of predicate logic. The way we are clarifying and highlighting the predicates, and then also adding to them their associate subjects, right? The subjects toward to which they add information. So we can also gain uh, information, or we can express information, or represent information when we are we have multiple uh, multiple things that are associated with the predicate. Right? So let's say we have uh, we can make M mean something is a mass of something else. Right? So notice we're um, of something that's a preposition, right? But we can include that in our definition of the predicate, right? So M simply could mean is a mass of, uh, x is a mass of y. So m x y means x is a mass of y. Right? So is a mass is our predicate really. So an s could mean the sun. And let's say g. Let's make g represent incandescent gas. So what we end up with is capital M representing our predicate, and then s g representing the two the two subjects. Notice how they fit into our formula. m x y means x is a mass of y. Well, msg means s is a mass of g. Okay, so this is how predicate logics are going. Logic is going to be working uh, throughout the rest of this uh, this curriculum and you know in the rest of these translations. So the sun is a, is a mass of incandescent gas here. Um, how about in this case, right? Dxy, um, the capital D is the predicate, and then x and y are subjects or or nouns. <clears throat> so dxy X has a date in Y. So let's say um, let's say we've got J for John and C for Constantinople. We could have D J C. John has a date in Constantinople. Right? Uh, so this is the way it, things work out in with predicate logic. All right. You might notice if you are this this could be bringing back some bad memories of when you were dealing with 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 math. Um, possibly when you were doing uh, algebra or uh, pre-calculus or even calculus. Sometimes you have f of x, right, which means uh, some sort of function of x. Predicate logic intentionally resembles mathematical logic. So you remember from math, if the function of x, x equals 2x plus 1, well then the function of 4 equals 2 times 4 plus 1. You just kind of plug in that number. So in the earlier slide, when we were talking about the variables x and y, it does work in a very similar way to mathematical variables, except obviously mathematical variables are going to be numbers, but in predicate logic, those variables are going to be uh, words right? or, or concepts or ideas. Predicates do behave as functions, right? and the subjects behave as variables or constants, if you want to kind of understand that kind of all together in one subject. So notice I've highlighted now the functions, which are in green. They're the things that are doing things to those variables, right? So the variables are in blue here in this case, and then the functions do things to the variables. Put another way, the functions add information to those variables, and then you end up with some kind of result, right? So just going back to our predicate logic expressions, Similar to, similarly to the way f of x is some sort of function of x, well, mx, in this case, in, the, in our use, is a predicate that deals with x or y, x and y. So ms at g is the son of a mass of incandescent gas in quite a similar way as the mathematical functions work. Now, it's worth noting that in mathematical logic, as I was suggesting a moment ago, the result is going to be either a function or a number. You're right. You might be able to logically deduce uh, some sort of other function that that follows naturally from the information that you're given. Now, the result also could be a number, which is the case in the example we have at the top of the screen. In predicate logic, you have a conclusion, and that conclusion is either going to be another proposition, and you might remember this from when we were dealing with natural deduction. You could end up with another proposition or some kind of truth value. It could turn out that something is, in fact, True, and that's a little bit parallel to the case in mathematics. Right? Propositions are kind of like functions. Truth values are kind of like numbers, and there are so there is some some connection between the two, um, somewhat directly. It's worth noting that a truth value can be expressed as a number. Typically, uh, false is zero and true is one. When we talk about modal logic or when we talk about probabilities, 
the truth value might be somewhere between 0 and 1. Right? If we don't know, but we have a good sense of the likelihood of something, then we might say, say, 0.5, which means there's a 50% chance that it's true. But for the, our purposes here, when we're dealing with predicate logic, we're not going to worry so much about the modal or probabilistic logic yet. More on variables, right? If a subject is unspecified or unknown, you kind of already saw this in previous slides, or if a subject represents a group of things, a variable or a placeholder becomes necessary, right? So let's say we have mxy. x is a mass of y. We might not know what x is. So mx on its own means things are masses, right? So x means things, right? mxg means Things are masses of incandescent gas. Notice we have clarified that um, that that second uh, subject, saying that it's it's incandescent gas. Right? All right. So then we can also switch it around. We could put it that way. M S X means the sun is a mass of things. Right. So you see how X always corresponds to something that is unspecified, something that we don't necessarily know, or something that represents a group. By convention in predicate logic. The letters, the lowercase letters a through w, are reserved for constants, and the letters x, y, and z are reserved for variables. Right? So this is very important to remember. So whenever you see a lowercase x, y, or z, you're talking about a variable, and whenever you see a lowercase a through w, we're talking about constants. Right? This is important because it indicates how we may or may not treat the statement. So for example, a statement could be referring to a whole group of things, not necessarily a particular subject or a particular item or element. Right? It might not refer to only one thing. And we treat things differently logically when it is the case that they're dealing with variables. We have to accommodate that in our reasoning. One of the great things about predicate logic is that it enables us to signify categories or groups or sets or classes and their constituents, right? The, the, the things that are members of those categories are members of those classes. So let's take, for example, the predicate F, which we'll take to mean is French, right? So is French. And well, that would mean that Fx means everything that is French, right? So x means could mean everything and anything. And the x, the I'm sorry, the f qualifies it to say that is is French, right? So Fx, everything that is French. F just literally means is French. Now, if we want to use a constant here, Fp, Pinot Noir is French, right? Okay, so just to visualize this, we can use Venn diagrams, right, to, to picture this here. If F means is French, right, then F is kind of like a circle that we draw around everything that is French, right? This, this circle represents everything that's French. All things that are French belong in this category. Now, Fx means everything that is French, right? So we are basically filling that category. We are, we are talking about everything that is French, right? And then if we have fp, fp, p is a constant, right? That, that subject is a constant. And so we might be referring specifically to Pinot Noir, right? In this case, we have one item or one element within all of the things that are French, and that is Pinot Noir, right? So this is very, it's very convenient to use these Venn style diagrams to think categorically and to think about elements of those categories. All right, so let's take an example of when we've got two different sort of overlapping categories represented by predicates. So F meaning is French, once again, W meaning is wine, okay? Now you might be able to anticipate where we can go with this. We can take things that are French, and then we can look at things that are wine, right? So F is the category of everything that's French, W is the category of everything that is wine, right? And these are still predicates, right? They're just simply referring to everything so far. Well, we take our, take our statement from the previous slide. Pinot Noir is French, right? Here it is. Pinot Noir is French. Well, Pinot, Pinot Noir is also wine, right? So what we can do is say Pinot Noir is French wine because the P exists in that overlap between things that are French and things that are wine. Pinot Noir is French. Pinot Noir is wine. Now notice, see how we are using the predicates to describe Pinot Noir as French and Pinot Noir as wine. And we can put this in the form of a propositional statement, right? We can say Pinot Noir is French wine, FP and WP. Pinot Noir is French wine. 
So we see the, the kind of descriptive power of predicate logic and the statements that we might use using this notation. It can be very effective and it provides for great precision when we are thinking carefully. More on categories or elements, we can also signify relationships between those categories when we're talking about entire groups, for example. So if we say P is a penguin, let's take that one. And let's say B is a bird. You might remember this from other videos. I'd like to use this, this, uh, this illustration. All right, well, we've got P representing everything that's a penguin and then B, which represents everything that's a bird. Well, we got PX, which represents everything that's a penguin and BX, which represents everything that's a bird. And what this ends up looking like with the Venn diagrams, and I prefer to use um, this sort of structure, this configuration. There are other ways of, uh, of describing these, uh, which accommodates additional information in, in more effectively. But I like to think about it this way. The entire set of things that are a penguin, right? Everything to which the, the predicate, everything is a penguin applies, um, is in, entirely encompassed within everything that's a bird, the category of birds. So everything that's a penguin is everything uh, is is included in the set of everything that's a bird. Now it's not exhaustive. That doesn't mean that everything is a penguin uh, des describes everything that's a bird. There are exceptions to that. We can see there is there there are members of uh, of the bird category that are outside the penguin category, right? And you might remember this from when we were discussing uh, uh, categorical statements and categorical syllogisms when we we're de dealing a lot with those Venn diagrams. What we end up having here, we end up, what this looks like, is that if anything is a penguin, then it is a bird. One of the things you'll notice about statements with variables, when we are talking, we're describing all of something, or when we're describing an entire group, typically we'll end up using a conditional statement, right? So if everything, if, if anything is a penguin, then it is a bird, right? Now, of course, and we'll talk more about this in the next video, but we're going to apply a quantifier to that, right, for, for specification purposes. And you'll see more reasons about why we want to do that later on. But for all x, if p is if x is p, then x is b, right? If anything is a penguin, then it is a bird. Some more examples of translation, right? So any proposition, we can take any statement, any declarative statement, and we can express it in this way. So let's take, for example, the phrase that we had earlier. If you have a date in Constantinople, she'll be waiting in Istanbul. Let's take uh, the predicate D, D, X, Y, Z, means X has a date with Y in Z, right? And then U could mean U, right? Now, um, the reason why I wanna use the letter U rather than the letter Y is because Y is reserved, you'll remember, for variables, right? So U is gonna be U, and, and, but U is a constant, right? And C is Constantinople. And then we could have W, X, Y. W will be waiting in Y, right? Where I means uh, Istanbul. I, and so notice we start with the variables, predicates referring to the variables, but then we can plug in those constants for these variables, if, depending on what we want to express. And so what we could plug in, what we could use when we plug in there is we could have D U X C. You have a date X in Constantinople, right? Now we, this is an unspecified date. If you have a date in Constantinople, if there is somebody who has a date that you have in Constantinople, Right, that's what D-U-X-C refers to. And I hope you can see how the constants and the variables relate to each other in this structure. D-X-Y-Z means X has a date with Y and Z. Well then D-U-X-C means you have a date X, an unspecified X in Constantinople. All right, now uh, we wanna plug in Istanbul for the second predicate, right? This, or the second, second phrase. X will be waiting in Istanbul. Okay, so now watch how this works together. We've got um, UXC, if you have a date in Constantinople, all right, X and X referring to that date, and notice X appears in the second part of this, uh, this, um, this proposition as well, WXI. Now X is the same, X refers to the same thing between in both parts of the statement. And it's important to keep track of that. One of the ways we do that is by using a quantifier, right? There is an X such that you have a date X in Constantinople, and therefore, uh, if, if that's the case, then that same X, that same person will be waiting in Istanbul, right? This is one of the ways we can express this using predicate logic. 
Any proposition can be expressed in this format. So let's take every adult citizen who is not a felon should be allowed to vote. You remember that from the first set of, of propositions that I was offering, the first set of statements. Every adult citizen who is not a felon should be allowed to vote. Well, we can take AX to mean X or X as an adult, CX to mean X as a citizen, and FX to mean X as a felon. Notice we're keeping the same kind of convention. Predicates are always in capital letters, and uh, the subjects are always in lowercase letters. In this case, the subjects so far are variables, right? And then VX, X should be allowed to vote, right? That's what VX is going to mean here. Well, then what we have is this statement. Um, if AX and CX and not FX, then VX, right? You can see how these all fit together in this statement, which shows this conditional between F, V of X and AX, CX, and FX, right? It shows how the logic works with these different predicates, predicate statements. Now, of course, we also want to use our quantifier here. And again, this is something we'll talk about later. But for all x, right, it's anything you plug in for x, um, this is going to be the case. There's not just one thing for, or a few things for, this is, for which this is the case. This is a universal statement. We're saying every adult citizen who is not a felon should be allowed to vote, right, in this case. So notice the x is consistent throughout, right? The x that is referred to from the by the universal quantifier in the beginning, that's the same x that applies to the remainder of the, the statement. Right? Okay, so this is the way we might put it in a kind of nice, neat package. Every adult citizen who's not a felon should be allowed to vote. Now here's another one. They'll need a crane. Right here we're going to use some quantifiers again uh, and existential quantifiers, but uh, we'll say n means x will need y. Right, n x y means x will need y. Right? And then let's take CX to mean X is a crane. Right? Well, what that means is, and here we're going to have two quantifiers. We have NXY and CY. Right? So um, X will need Y and Y is a crane. Right? X, will need, X will need Y and Y is a crane. Right? And so that means that there is an X and there is a Y such that NXY and CY. And notice how the, the quantifiers work here. There is, um, there is there is somebody, in this case, it refers to the unspecified they, right, they'll, um, and then uh, and then we'll need a Y. Well, what is Y? Y is a crane, right? So there is an X and there is a Y such that uh, X will need Y and Y is a crane, right? X will need a crane. Now, this may seem a little bit um, uh, elaborate and a little bit sophisticated, and it almost seems as though we've overcomplicated things. But again, when we are thinking logically and we're trying to compare statements logically, we're trying to look at the consistency between different phrases or statements, we need to make sure that we keep track of our variables, keep track of our constants. Um, otherwise, we could lose track of them and then we could end up making a mistake. We can end up contradicting ourselves or we could end up producing something that is an invalid uh, deduction from our original statements. I, I should also mention at this point, your brain kind of already does this, or at least it already tries to do this. Your brain keeps track of these constants and variables. Your brain keeps track of these subjects and predicates. It's just that we usually don't express it in this kind of symbolic form. But now we're doing that because we want to be very careful about our consistency. Okay, more translation examples. This may be helpful. We'll just go through some additional ways of using predicate logic and applying it to statements. People who drink alcohol or who smoke have increased health risks. Okay, so notice we've got a we've got a a really universal statement. We're talking about people, right? Generally, people in general. And then notice we've got an or there, right? That or is another operator logically, right? That can be expressed as this, right? For all x, um, dxa or sx, um, then uh, implies rx, right? So people who drink alcohol, right? That's the d. XA, notice the X there, people people who drink, drinking alcohol, right, XA. Oh, I should have, you know, uh, this could actually be improved or more specified if I also clarified that X refers to people and not just things, right? We might add uh, PX somewhere in this statement, but just to keep it a little simple, I thought I'd do it this way. Uh, everything that drinks alcohol or that smokes um, has increased health risks, risks here. So if something drinks alcohol or something smokes, then that thing has increased health risks. How about this one? Mary is eligible for the American presidency 
only if she is over 35 and born in the U.S. or born to a U.S. citizen. Right? Um, now, I, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how all this uh, is expressed legally. Does it need to be? Does only one of her parents need to be a U.S. citizen? Um, my daughter, for example, was born in, in England, but both of her parents are U.S. citizens, so she is eligible to be president of the United States one day. Who knows? Either way, we can represent this statement um, in this way. Uh, EMP, right? So notice we're not talking about variables in this case. We're talking about constants, specifically Mary, right? Okay, now is eligible for something. We can express that as E. Notice E is a, is a predicate here. Mary is eligible for the American presidency. So we've got E, M, P. P meaning presidency, right? So another way of, uh, of thinking about this, well, the, the basic definition of this predicate is E, X, Y means X is eligible for Y. Right. And in this case, EMP, Mary is eligible for the American presidency. All right. Now, only if now remember with only if and this is a kind of a throwback to when we're dealing with operators and propositional statements, only if means that the um, the antecedent um, can is the the first part of the sentence. And then only if means that the consequent is going to uh, remain after the conditional statement. Right. So only if she's over 35 and born in the US or born to a United States citizen. So you see the OM means over 35, Mary is over 35, OM. And, and then these two, this, this, this disjunction in parentheses, BMU means Mary is born in the US, and then CMU means Mary is a citizen of the US. Okay, so we see how the predicates work here, right? Now, notice I'm kind of adding some language to this sentence when I'm clarifying it in predicate form. But hopefully you'll see the way that this really does represent what the previous sentence said. It's just that we're trying to keep track of these, these predicates. All right. So Mary's eligible for the American presidency only if she's over 35 and born in the United States or born to a United American citizen. All right. How about this one? All prime numbers are odd except the number two. All right. We can take that statement. For all x, px, uh, for all x, x is prime and um, if, if x is prime and x does not equal 2, then it's odd, right? Okay, so see this conditional statement. Um, for all x, if x is prime and x is not equal to, then, uh, then, uh, then it's odd, right? Okay, now this is, a, this is language using an exception. You know, we've, haven't, we've not yet in this video seen the is not equal to. But I hope you can see how this will work out, right? It's an exception. As long as x is not 2, and x is prime, then it's odd. Right? Here's another one. Uh, just last last uh, example that we'll, we'll we'll see. At all moments, there is someone who is at the tomb of the unknown soldier. Right? So notice here we're talking about all moments for all x. Right? Now notice the the x refers to or the m refers to x. Right? For all moments, uh, there exists. Right? So notice the existential um, quantifier there for all x. There exists a y such that um, that mx implies ty. Right? At all moments, there is someone at the tomb of the unknown soldier. Right? Um, another convention you'll see, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, that usually when we're dealing with universal uh, quantifiers, there's going to be some kind of conditional statement because uh, we're referring to groups in some way at some point. And then when there's an existential quantifier, typically we'll end up seeing some kind of conjunction. Right? And that wraps up our introduction of translations in predicate logic. In the next video, we will talk about quantifiers in predicate logic. Look forward to seeing you there.